happy to introduce to you a young man named Alvin. Is it is it Howlin? Is that how you say your last name, Alvin? Yes. Um, you were born in China, grew up in Beijing, and attended an international high school in Beijing to prepare for admission to an American university. And I want to kind of start the story there, because now you are at an American university. But what happened in your high school years to give you, and I'm just going to put words in your mouth, some doubt about the Chinese governmental system? Um, when I was in the high school, like... Uh, sometimes I was required to do some like research projects. Um, those are in English, and so I have to like do some like uh, search by using some uh, services like uh, Google Scholar. But under Ch in China, like we have a great firewall, the whole Google service was blocked, so that uh, I have to choose to uh, to learn how to use the VPN. It's called a uh, virtual private network to access uh, the following websites banned by the Chinese government. How many people would you just estimate in your own group of, of friends or family use a VPN to get around the Great Firewall? Um, for my families, they uh, didn't use that because uh, they grew up like... They believe they choose to believe in what the government said, and uh, but I didn't blame them for that. Um, but for my like classmates, um, some of it, some of them use it. Uh, I think the majority of them use it, but they're not necessarily for uh, watching the uh, things spent by the government. Sometimes they just choose to be quiet and to do their things. Um, yeah, it's a quite a, a large amount, but. I estimate currently things get worse because the government now has like more like uh, developed more ways to detect uh, whether there are people using VPN. Sometimes they uh, do like warn those people to not use it or let them to pay some fine. So there's a there's a surveillance um, system in China that you got caught up by when you posted something on a group chat. Tell me about that. Well, that was like uh, happened years ago during the uh, COVID, and yes, yeah, it was just I posted a snapshot uh, from the YouTube. It's a video about Xi Jinping. He like couldn't handle a complex question asked by a journalist, so that I just feel like it was quite a, a funny uh, video, and I, I think it's probably quite a similar like the Americans. Sometimes they saw the uh, clips like Joe Biden or Donald Trump uh, to say something interesting and it's just funny. So I took the snapshot of it and I sent it to a group chat and I said something like uh, by his like uh, names and and at, at the at the beginning I thought that was not a big deal because uh, because I I probably did the things like this before and I didn't face the severe consequence. Uh, but just after one day. Uh, I received a not notification from the WeChat says uh, my account was permanently banned. And the reason is they said is because I spread malicious rumor. Oh, wow. And when. So yeah, that's qu quite a scary thing. WeChat is the platform that most Chinese people use as a chat client, right? Yes. So to be knocked off WeChat, do you have a way to communicate with your friends now? Uh, no. After that happened, I lost all of my uh, contacts with my friends. And not only that, I lost the other things like access to the payment, access to the health QR code. It's just... So wait a minute. Basically so so a you, like you lost the ability to do electronic payments because of that? Yes. So explain to me how large the social credit system is a little bit. And because that's what it sounds like. Was this part of the social credit system where you had been deemed unworthy of having access to this digital currency? Or, or explain to me what the Chinese government does in terms of the social credit system. Uh, honestly, for because I grew up in Beijing and I think 
uh, sometimes I think currently from what I know, Beijing does not have a fully like uh, really like strict stringent social credit system. Uh, it was more like something like um, you know with contingent and something like with a like higher uh, uncertainty. But the authority they have the power to uh, easily like prevent a person from uh, like going to other places of the country, traveling, or like suspend their like social media accounts, and yeah, like to and also or abuse the. Uh, technologies like health QR codes to keep them a rat code so that they can't move around the city. So they can essentially take away your ability to do anything. Yes, they could. Now, the alternative, though, is is what? Going to jail? I mean, were you threatened with any kind of more severe penalties because of that? Yes, I would say they... and. And here the thing is, they not only uh, threaten me, uh, they not only intimidated me by saying, like, if I continue to do so, I would face, like, custody for days or even the being uh, prosecuted. But they, on- but they also threatened my family. They said this would influence my, uh, like, my parents' careers, my siblings, uh, you know, the schools he could go. And... Yeah, it's like one per, it's basically a thing like one person's trouble is the whole family's trouble. It's like a joint responsibility or collective punishment in college. So you got out of China and came to the United States to go to college. Tell me a little bit about how you joined Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, I listened about, I heard about this organization from a friend of mine. Like he, I met him in a, like a theological seminar. And at the beginning, I did not understand too many things about the American politics. But in our first like a chapter meeting uh, at my college, so they just said they're against communism, against the socialism. So they, yeah, I said, yeah, that's where I should belong to because I have so many uh, firsthand experience of living under socialism. Does it is it disheartening for you when you hear young college students saying that socialism is a better system than what we have? Yeah, honestly, that's a quite a like a uh, uh, annoying thing for me when I saw sometimes <laughs> they're like democratic socialist like class tabling, and I know probably they're trying to say, okay, we're democratic, we're not like a sort of authoritarian communism, but I believe they're like. Uh, essentially same. Are you going to go back to China at some point? Uh, probably no. Like so many things happened there with me and I, um, and I'm quite afraid after I choose, after I joined the, uh, as I joined the Young Americans for Freedom, also joined the Dissident Project, uh, become more like, uh, outspoken so that they probably have already noticed me. Are you worried about your family still in Beijing? Um, somewhat worried about, and but I'll yeah, it's just currently uh, they're they're doing fine, but I'm not sure like whether how it will go in the future. Alvin Halen is my guest, and Alvin, I just want to say I can I cannot imagine, and I think most Americans cannot imagine feeling like you have to leave your country and leave your family in order to have the best opportunity and and to be able to have the basic freedoms that you enjoy here that is incredibly brave and i want to commend you for that because a lot of people would not have had the wherewithal and then to come here and to use your own experiences to talk about freedom and and the realities of socialism and communism that is an incredible gift that you give to people and i hope that you impact and and i hope a lot of people listen to you about this especially while you're in college when are you graduating uh i think i'm graduating the incoming spring yeah, and you're a real slouch, a double major in applied mathematics in the history of public policy and law. I mean, you sound like a real slacker there, Alvin. I'm just kidding. You're going to go on and be a lawyer? Yes, that's what I hope to do. Alvin Halen, I appreciate your time today, and I appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Thank you.